This is our first presentation of Splice Institute 2023. Super excited. It features our guest ensemble, Pope Bama, who's made up of Aaron Rodgers and Dennis Sullivan. They were amazing guests with Splice Institute a few years ago when we were remote, and it's been awesome already, and I don't even know what day it is, but I don't think we've been here that long yet, and it's already great, and they represent and act in such a awesome way relative to like what I think we try to be about and it's great to have them here. We're super excited for the presentation, concert tomorrow, and there'll be a concert tonight at 7.30, so let's welcome Pope Bob. <laughs> essentially trying to work with a one-to-one -one relationship of uh, performative action to sound production. Um, so similar to the idea of, you know, we hit the snare drum with a drumstick and we can very much confirm, like, I saw the hand go up, I saw the stick come down, I saw the drumstick hit the head, and yes, I, I, I see that that indeed is, was the action that produced the sound, Zero mystery. <laughs> um, and the idea of trying to apply that same one-to-one -one action to sonic event relationship to the world of electronics. Uh, but before we dive into all that, maybe we'll uh, give a little introduction to uh, the group, to Pope Obama. Yeah, first things first. Pope Obama. Obama. Pope Bama. Dennis is a percussionist, I'm a saxophonist, and uh, we are both composers, and we both like to improvise. So when we got together, uh, it made sense to start trying things out musically, um, bring in our compositions. A lot of times we'll make compositions together, map them, um, workshop them, build on them. Um, but the idea of the duo was to try, um, to try new things. Um, Obama. Not again. Not again. Obama. <laughs> So, we're still working on our slideshow ability, but our performance ability is better than that. Um, so, Pope, Pope Alma, um, we like to drive uh, fresh new sounds. We've been um, sort of touring around, um, mostly playing pieces that we've written for each other, but then uh, in recent years have begun commissioning and doing new uh, pieces by other voices that we, you know, are, we find interesting and, and want to work with. So, we've sort of expanded our, our voice through others uh, that we collaborate with. Yeah, and it's been particularly rewarding in the last, I think, uh, few years as we've started to bring in other voices and other composers kind of into the Bombaverse. Let's call it Bombaverse. Um, we, we've, there's kind of this approach of like nothing is off the table, um, be it from a purportive standpoint, from a gear standpoint, from an electronic standpoint, from a theatrical standpoint. Um, we'll try any of it once um, and possibly keep doing it for <laughs> the duration. Um, and what's been interesting with that is um, we feel like we've created a very distinct 
world and a very distinct voice with the duo. And then when we bring uh, uh, other folks into that, um, as opposed to uh, having a new percussion and saxophone piece, um, it kind of feels like that particular individual or composers or collaborators take on the like Fobama sound world, or maybe the Fobama lack of limitation, um, which has been yeah super rewarding. Uh, so as you'll see tomorrow, we will have quite a few pieces um, outside of things that Aaron and I have written specifically for the group. Yeah, and if you can see around our shadows, we put some little bio information up here. But of course, uh, any more information you'd like about the group could be uh, found at Pope Bomba Nation um, and PopeBomba.com. Uh, we have a YouTube channel with lots of videos. We try to document all of our stuff. Um, and we're going to show a presentation today that's mostly video, since we'll be performing tomorrow night. Uh, so it will save a lot of the performance, uh, the physical performance for tomorrow. But we wanted to show uh, uh, some of the things that we've done and some of the ways we've used electronics and integrated that aspect into our performance world today. Uh, so interestingly enough, um, most, a lot of what you'll see today um, are actually videos that we made for the 2021 uh, Splice Festival, um, in addition to a few things. But actually all the pieces today are uh, kind of our, our original set or the first kind of set of pieces that we, we worked through and championed for the last uh, maybe four or five years, and everything you'll see tomorrow is um, very fresh <laughs> um, and very new and kind of, I think, what we see as the next uh, kind of evolution of the, of the group and where we're heading. Yeah, so um, behind me you see a number of ways that we use and integrate electronics into our setup. Uh, effects pedals is a big one. Uh, we both play with a lot of effects pedals. Um, I'm a saxophonist initially, um, but we use them for everything. But as a saxophonist, that means that I'm going to mic my instrument typically and run it through these effects. So I go from this sort of analog mic situation into um, into a pedal that can you know, either take a line in a digital uh, signal or uh, or an analog signal. In my case, it is actually an analog signal, but it's allowed me to use um, to change my sound quite a bit. Um, whether it's vocalizing, whether it's playing saxophone, whether it, you know, I can then to choose ways in which I can suddenly change it on a whim and visually change it. Um, and, you know, of course, because, I mean, you, a lot of times with effects photos, we use this word like stomp box, right? Literally a box to be stomped upon. <laughs> um, and a lot of times that toggle switch is where, where, they, it, it, where it's been constructed so that it, like you, you want to like feel it, like you feel that click you got to feel through the sole of your shoe and whatnot because you wanted you to be able to feel that something did indeed happen like I did indeed engage the pedal and a lot of times it's used in like a rock band right where it's just like the the volume of the music is loud enough that you don't get that that audible click is not an issue um, in our case um, it's always an issue um, but we've kind of made this conscious choice to say well heck with it we're gonna kind of write it into the pieces so a lot of times we actually kind of embrace that click or, you know, maybe blend the, the click of the pedal with some, you know, tongue slaps or, or wood blocks or things that just like it just, it, it has to be, become, has to become part of the music as opposed to always trying to like walk on eggshells and very quietly, you know, engage with the pedal and the action. We just kind of embrace it and like the leg and just, just go for it. Um, which is again, this idea of performative electronics. It's also for us, we think it's nice to have a visual representation. Like, yes, the sonic event is now changing now that we're engaging the pedal. Well, let's actually physically show that it's happening in addition to the actual change in the, in the sonic environment. Yeah, the next thing we have on the list is stage mixers. And we use, um, we were talking about this in our, uh, our improv class today, but having the control on stage to do your own mix of uh, both uh, you know, acoustic instruments and electronic signals uh, that are sound making on stage with a mixer allows us to control what we send to the house or send to the board. So um, in a lot of cases, you'll see stage mixers in our setups and we'll actually physically play them. And in a lot of our scores, we notate in when we adjust these mixers. And that adds an element of not only control, but when we're moving the mixers, and we'll show you in real time, um, we actually change the sound have these cues marked in and allow the audience sort of a bird's eye view of some of these things so that they see why the volume is coming down, sort of taking the ghosts out of the machine. 
So the idea is to view the mixer just as another instrument. So you have, we have our mute buttons, which are our, our gate signals, you know, send on and off, um, and volume faders for dynamic curves and you know, like a three-stage EQ, high, mid, low, and we essentially have like a, a, a live filter um, on stage. Um, it's also been really helpful. Um, we, we've always tried to have this spirit of like, you know, the, everything can work in a, in a very large venue and everything can work in a very small venue. So we can play this concert hall, but um, can also take it, take all of these pieces, put them in an art gallery, put them in somebody's basement or whatever. Um, that's where the, the stage mixer can be really helpful because maybe we play a show at a venue that doesn't have a ton of sound support, doesn't have an expert audio engineer, things like that. Um, we are self-sufficient. We don't have to say, okay, so we're going to send you these 14 channels. <laughs> um, instead of just like, here's, the, here's our stereo out and we're good. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is if you have an expert audio engineer, like here, you do kind of take a little bit of agency away from the sound engineer. So it is something to think about. If you're thinking of kind of like giving yourself that kind of control on the stage. In this setting, the more control you're giving yourself, you are taking a little bit of control away from the engineer, which can be dicey or, or it's sometimes to your detriment because sometimes you want their expertise, right, to do that balancing and that sculpting and not only have agency over like the master volume of the entire like manifold of sounds. And then feedback instruments, um, we use feedback a lot, and I think we'll talk more about it as we get into the pieces, just um, for time and to get through this list. Um, analog synthesizers, we use a lot of uh, um, analog synth on stage, and the mapping of that is also uh, a very big part of our Usually always with some kind of like tactile controller. Again, we're very much about the one-to-one -one action, so we like to be able to show. The, the, the gating on and off of the sounds. Mm -hmm. Samplers, where we're using a lot of what we call triggers. We um, have disco MIDI instruments in some cases that, uh, that start sound samples, like pre-recorded audio samples that, uh, that are then triggered. So then even though it's not a sound that we're making in real time, we're showing the triggering of the on and the off of those actions. And then, uh, of course, some transducers a lot of times just to be able to um, sometimes sculpt a sound in a way that is um, allowing for the resonant body that the transducer is mounted on to kind of map its own sonic properties onto the sound that it's that it's running through or sometimes a frequency that is so low that we're not actually, actually going to hear it but maybe that sub pitch is sitting on a little plate of metal that will kind of like dance around and it's not actually about the sub pitch it's about getting the thing exciting the the transducer to get things to kind of shake and rattle. And then, yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about what some of these things are in addition to, you know, just using the terms, so like the idea of what a transducer is. We'll go into it in more in context. But just uh, to move along, we have the why. Why, why perform with electronics? Well, yeah. <laughs> we're figuring this out. Um, so mapping, right? Um, Dennis just mentioned the idea of visually mapping the one-to-one -one relationship of something we do performatively on stage with a change or um, an, an initiation or some sort of uh, some sort of sound effect that occurs, right? So a, as an experiencer of this in any way, visually, um, audibly, you will have a way of mapping patterns of what we're doing with the sounds that you hear and the visual actions that you see. And being able to make the, the connection between those is a very human thing. It's a very, very basic thing we're, you know, from birth that we were born with. And it's, it's really important as, um, as we continue to engage audiences, especially with this music become more and more experimental, that we're able to sort of invite, um, invite audiences in to understand it a little bit more. And that's something we try to do and prioritize. Mm -hmm. We try to think a lot about control, and maybe another word for that would be agency. And the ratio, especially if we're dealing with electronic devices, the ratio between uh, human or performer agency and or mechanical device, computer, synth, whatever agency, what, what degree of control do we have over the sound? And is there any kind of degree of control that we're giving to the machine? And what is the balance of that? And of course, that would then affect mapping, that would affect Choreography, kind of these three are all kind of tied in together, and and moving, you know, the balancing of one moves the other in, in, in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. And to add to choreography, um, the idea that the purpose for these movements, or the fact that sound is sort of 
um, is sort of shaping some of these movements and, and creating the answer to the why. Um, create, can sometimes create a built-in form or choreography to pieces that's very, uh, that's generative and can be very exciting to sort of formulate. And, and we'll show that with a piece uh, that, that is uh, one of our examples in this hour. So we're going to start with a uh, piece of Aaron's, one of our earlier pieces, uh, Wormhole. Have we lost it? Uh, we have brown slayer. offline here. Let me get a Aaron's the one that has so much more to say about her work than I do, but I'm going to jump in just so we can keep moving. Uh, one of the ideas behind her piece, Wormhole, was um, to work with uh, instruments that all created their sound via some sort of like forced air. So of course, for saxophone, that you'll see a lot of whistles, you'll see some like bellows uh, style, like foot pumps, I think we got, I think they were like for blowing up an air mattress or a yoga, yoga ball or something like that. Um, so anyway, we got a little wormhole. That's just a small excerpt from a piece from um, five years ago now, uh, and one of the first pieces that Dennis and I played together. So there's a number of electronic elements that were performed upon there, um, and uh, in addition to the, of course, the, one, the instruments that were initiated by air sounds of some sort. But we have foot pedals, right? So I'm dealing with the reverb pedal, um, which can create a very expanded reverberant sort of sound, and it goes back and forth between a dry kind of uh, atmosphere and a, and a very reverberant one. 
Uh, we have uh, a freeze pedal that is able to freeze some of these sounds and sort of sustain them over time, and that allows, um, in some cases, where the phrase ends and our limbs are all busy putting instruments away and doing this sort of economical setting down of things and getting new things, um, it allows us to sustain the sound, right? It, so it adds that, uh, it works as a tool in a lot of cases, um, the freeze pedal does. And then we have, um, uh, the mixer, the stage mixer, which you could see was very clearly set between us. Um, you can sort of see it right there between both of us. That is doing all the routing for the amplification, the pedals, but also, <laughs> but also um, when we move the faders up and down, it clearly brings some of the sound in and out. And so what that does is it creates not only diminuendo when you're taking those sounds out, but the visual aspect of this is how we're doing that, right? It's sort of. You know, you see a trombonist do it, you know exactly what's happening, right? They're, they're, they're decreasing their air, they're ending that note. In this case, you're seeing exactly what's happening. That's why that sound's going away. So it's creating an instrument out of an electronic device. And uh, we actually, we love this old Behringer, it's like 20 years old and just won't go away. Um, I don't know how it's still alive, but it is. Um, but one thing we love for this piece is actually to have the mixer face forward like that. And we really prefer like the, the, the fader as opposed to the dial because for the audience you can just map that action in such a like more clear gesture than, than this. <laughs> um, and it, it essentially, you know, the way we've routed it, it works almost like a volume pedal, which is we send, uh, you know, we have our mics, microphones going to the mixer and sending the pedal chain through the auxiliary, through the aux send, and then the effects get their own channel. Um, so then we can capture something in the freeze pedal with the volume down on the aux end, and then two minutes later in the piece, you can bring that you can bring that back, and it's almost like a it's like our little like time travel machine. We can recall a sound that happened. You know, we'll do the same thing with you know looping pedals as opposed to creating like a a looping structure. Um, we'll cap we'll use it to like capture something, and then three minutes later, unmute the aux channel, and suddenly you have you can kind of call back something that you did two or three minutes ago. And it's a way to do that, that we have a little bit more like flexibility uh, with, with that in the live sense as opposed to like putting this in some sort of like fixed media situation where of course then we, a lot of them have to be on click track or something like that, you know, it just gives us a little bit more like aliveness and nowness to, to that, that sonic event. Just briefly to finish up with Wormhole, we're just gonna show a little bit of the score with the same, um, with the same uh, excerpt you heard. for us as performers, we stop and we reset, but the sound continues in a different way each time. And those are usually when the direction of, you know, get cup, um, full deflation of balloon, that, def that balloon deflating is sort of carrying us through to the next phrase beginning. Um, also, you'll, you'll notice uh, score-wise we've got um, player one and player two. We don't really think of it as sax percussion in this piece. It's more like we're both players. And then we have a foot pedal line where each of us are busy doing the foot pedal things underneath. In general, Aaron did a really good job of scoring this like high to low in relation to the body. So like a lot of the, at least I can speak for my part, a lot of my whistles that are up here on, on the line are, are, are up high on the staff and all the stuff with the foot pedals are down low. And it, it just helps for, you know, when you're reading something that is I mean, really, there's no standard here, so right, the, the way to, the only uh, ways to kind of make your own notational system.
but to try and find something that like relates or visually, you know, like you know, understands just like, well, I don't, you know, when you're in the learning process, I don't completely remember what that is up there yet, but I know it's up here somewhere because it's up there on the staff, and I know that this, you know, a lot of activity down there where well, my feet are doing something, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's helpful. One last thing I'll point to on this page, the freeze, the effects pedals are also notated in the foot pedal line, in addition to the air pedals, it's the, uh, so the freeze pedal in the bottom line is C. So right where that 5 8 measure starts, that horizontal line holds that freeze over the grand pause, and that's notated. And the, the actual pedal hit is notated at an exact point in that measure, and it's taken off at an exact point in the next measure. And two of the, one of the things that does is it stops the effect right at a particular time, but it also hides the click or uses the click um, articulation and that sound um, to be a trigger for the next phrase. So incorporating that sound, which is a very large sound, you hear guitar pedals click, it's a very apparent sound, and especially in a piece that has a lot of sort of effect and uh, gadgetry, um, those types of sounds. Okay, to ignore that from the world is sort of to take, to, to, um, to, to not include it, I think is, is could be problematic for the piece because it plays such a large role audibly. Okay. Uh, so next, this is one, uh, Technically Yes by Jenna Lyle was one of the first pieces that we commissioned. Jenna was one of the first uh, composers that we reached out to um, and really wanted to work with her. Um, Jenna's based in Chicago, um, is part of the performance collective uh, Mock Prep. And um, she works in this really interesting way where we, you know, we reached out, we said, you know, here's our funding structure, here's what we have, we'd really like a piece from you. And her first thing was like, well, I'm going to come to New York. And that's it. That is where the piece, you know, there, there wasn't like a score delivery or anything like that. Uh, we got in a room together. Uh, she had an idea for kind of a, a setup and a rig that she wanted to work with and a general like theatrical space that she wanted to occupy. Her, her work is very much rooted in a lot of uh, physical gesture and, and physical theater and a lot of movement. Um, and so she, she created uh, a little feedback instrument. Um, and the, the instrument exists uh, inside Aaron's soprano sax. So you can see we're both engaging with the, the horn there uh, on the picture. And so what she did was we take these small little capsule mics or these little lapel microphones and put it through, I think, well, I guess one of the keyholes of the, uh, of the saxophone and then take some really cheap, like $2 slash free, like airline style earbuds um, and put those in the other end um, and there's your feedback. <laughs> you just like mic right on speaker. It's as lo-fi as it gets. Um, and through that, we then have a whole bunch of options with Aaron's moving of the horn, opening and closing of keys. Um, we put a microphone inside the horn and amplify that feedback even more. Um, I as well have a lapel mic on my finger um, and a similar system and a clarinet sitting on a table in front of us. And I also have a small mixer in front that I can use to kind of nudge the levels and nudge some of the, the, the um, EQ to lean into one particular feedback sound. Or if I see the entire room cringing, um, lean out of the feedback sound, at least if they've been nice. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really incredible that, that you can really, it kind of like demystifies this feedback world um, by there's so much one-to-one -one action of, you know, uh, uh, the hand moves or horn moves and the sound very clearly changes. Um, you know, these, and this is our, our wonderful little uh, stage diagram, our little stage diagram here. Um, and when we create these feedback instruments, one way we like to think of it is if you've ever tried to work with a feedback piece, you know that it can be pretty risky, which is you dial in your sound and you know exactly, well, if I do this and I have the microphone here and the speaker here and I'm on a wood floor and things are reflecting in this way and I have all this control over the feedback, great. And then you go and you have dinner and you come back and do your concert 
and a bunch of people come in. Now there's all these like fleshy bodies and maybe it's winter and they have a bunch of winter coats on and stuff. And suddenly like the sound doesn't reflect anymore, right? You have like these wooden chairs, but now there's fleshy masses in the chairs and like it won't, <laughs> the sound won't come back at you and all this feedback that you dialed in doesn't work. Um, so one of the ideas here is to, instead of using the room, the saxophone's the room um, and the clarinet is the room. Um, and, it, and we can aid things by maybe we put a speaker under, our, under the table so there's a little bit more from the PA coming back into the, into the uh, lapel mics or what have you. But we can also like alter the shape of the room. You know, Aaron can close all the keys and it's like, cool, we're in a room, doors shut, windows are shut. Um, and then maybe she lifts her first figure. It's like, cool, we went up the stairs and we opened the, the window in the second bedroom. <laughs> and now we have a different you know, now we have a different di feedback dyad coming through or whatever. Um, so it's kind of a way to not depend so much on the physical space to create the feedback, but the instrument itself, which, um, you know, unless, I don't know, unless we run it over with a truck or something, the saxophone isn't going to change. The horn's going to be the same every time we, we take it out. So it's, it, it, it gives us a little bit more agency to know what we'll be working with each time. So to put put all this in context, let's, uh, let's hear a little bit and see a little bit.
so, um, and with Jenna's piece, of course, you can start to see how uh, that piece over, over time could be shaped. Um, we, we talked about choreography at the beginning. One of the driving forces behind the way that that piece uh, moved formally and, um, and, our, and sort of inspired our movements. Uh, a lot of this, uh, eventually we move around the front. Um, a lot of that is inspired by the way that the feedback pulled us in certain directions. Um, whether it was proximity to each other, proximity to another microphone that was on the clarinet right in front, which um, was kind of hard to see at that point, but uh, was there. And then the way that we moved ourselves in relation to the room. So that inspires movement, and it's also, it's also something that maps, right? You can hear the difference in the sound as it changes as we move closer to one thing and away from it. And of course, all these pieces are online, so if you want to kind of, there's a whole other, you know, kind of wind up moving around the table once we get in front of the speaker. There's a whole different world that's actually a bit more aggressive, but not as like high sign toning. Um, so all that stuff's online if you want to check out more of it. So we're going to move on to um, Operating Manual, third edition by Alex Christie, a friend of Splice who uh, I think we first met at Splice years ago, maybe 2017, in this very building. So Alex is a, a composer at um, uh, University of Virginia and uh, has been there for a long time. He's now the uh, I think, uh, technical, technical director, director yeah. in the um, computer uh, computer music department. So, um, but Alex works a lot with lights, and so when he wrote us this piece, uh, it was sort of a, a departure from our regular instruments and um, a way of using light as counterpoint, a way of using uh, triggers, uh, which in this piece we didn't bring it today, but we actually play power strips. Um, in, as opposed to you know, keyboards or other instruments and other uh, sort of MIDI triggers, we're actually playing a power strip, which is powering lights on and off. And this was a really nice situation where we you know, were able to collaborate on a set of Alex Philippe circuits, and they have these little photo cells that react to uh, varying degrees of light and saturation of light. Uh, so there's a white light bulb, there's a red light bulb, those get moved around, um, and then there's strobe lights, and you know, he, he asked for very specific speeds of the strobe lights and then said, you know, what I really want here is I, I just want you to turn, turn them on and off. Like, that's the piece. Um, like, well, how do we get a setup together? And I, we happen to have these power strips that we've been working with that every um, plug on the strip has its own on-off toggle switch. Um, so the piece is really just us sitting in front of a power strip and, and playing it, turning the lights on and off. Um, he wrote it on a timeline. Um, sorry that we don't have a slide, and I hope I'm going to just zoom in <laughs> as best I can there. Um, and they're just in five second intervals. So we play the piece uh, at quarter and equal 60 in 5 4. Um, he didn't, uh, sometimes you can see there's these kind of like dotted hashed lines. He asked for a few complex unisons, so we actually prescribed some rhythms um, and, and made up our own notes. So you can see where we have written in, hey, zoom. <laughs> um, you can see where we actually started to write in some, some particular uh, rhythmic values. Um, and you know, that's what I wanted to be sending a video one time when we were practicing, because we can practice, technically practice the piece anywhere. We just need the power strip and a metronome. It doesn't have to be plugged into the lights. Um, and I sent him a video, and I remember him watching the video. He's like, I had no idea those rhythms were in there. That's crazy. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Um, but the, but then the result, the result sound of the circuit is is all Alex. You know, it's all it's his his vision. Um, so kind of this really cool collaborative effort. Um, it's worth checking out a little bit. Yeah, it's worth noting too that the light bulbs the, the light bulbs control the sound on off, and that's what is actually triggering the sound. And so when we played this piece, we got our iPads up, and that was actually drawing away from the uh, sound of the circuits because it was offering too much light. So we found an interesting little trick. Ah, if you click super the button, disorienting to read. <laughs> if you click the button three times, uh, you can invert your score to black and white. And it's not that easy to get it if you're playing traditional music. But for this purpose, we actually got used to looking at the the inverted score. So uh, just a warning, there's some flashing lights in this video, so um, be aware, and if you need to leave, uh, we understand. Um, leave or close your eyes if you don't want the lights, it's totally, totally cool.
and we do that on click. Um, that, was, that was an immediate, immediately we recognized very quickly, just like, oh, we're gonna, we need to make a click track. Because also, it's such a, like, kind of like, it's not a very human feeling piece or action, so it actually made sense to kind of go in the, like, anti-chamber music direction, and like, let's, let's move as far away as we can, put it in the click and really not engage with one another at all. I mean, let's just head down, see you in 20 minutes. Um, which, cool. So worth noting, uh, it doesn't get more performative electronic than performing on a power strip. Um, but one of the other interesting things about this piece is just the way that the light interacts with the sounds you hear. So you're hearing clicks and there's certain mapping of light to those clicks. And that is powerful, right? The, this, again, this mapping that we talked about at the beginning, this idea that I'm seeing what I'm hearing, it's mapping, I can draw patterns, I can create, you know, it, 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 um, it builds an, uh, just an intrinsic rhythm into the music in this case. And this type of music, which we consider music, and there, you know, we won't get into whether it's really music or not, or what, or what the definition of music is. Um, it's compelling in, in that way, and that's one of the reasons uh, we enjoy playing it. Um, before we, uh, I think we'll start this next one just by showing a clip of the piece first and then sort of breaking it down. So this is Showdown. This is a piece that Dennis and I wrote collaboratively. We got together and uh, created, uh, created the piece together in this way that was really just one item, one item, one item, discussing everything. So it is by Paul Baum in the realest sense. That's why it took so long. There are four fouls. And there are four fouls on the play. That's why. Just like 
sports calls, like just the, like announcers and like this crazy cadence that they all have, and they kind of have their their own thing and their own vibe. So we found these uh, these like different calls, uh, and, and and then transcribed rhythmically transcribed. Like we'll put a metronome on at sixty and just you know figure out the like speech rhythm of the call. Um, and then you know Erin had this idea to use her uh, Keith McMillan soft step foot pedal. Um, and instead of actually, because you know it's it, it's meant to uh, it needs you you need to step on it, right? It's meant to like it will trigger a sound, whatever sample you load up. Um, in this case, Aaron used the program Q Lab, which is often used for theater, and lighting, and and, and whatnot. Um, and and usually the pedal needs like the weight of a human, <laughs> you know, to like get it get it to actuate. Um, and so in this this case, if we put it on the table and actually tried to play the thing, you have to hit it pretty hard. Um, we decided that that was kind of the game, that was the piece, it's like this whack-a-mole, like just hitting the thing, and, and it misfires a lot, like if we're at a gig where the table's like not stable, or it's like, maybe there's like a carpeting on it, or like a cushion, like it actually like misfires a bunch, and we just, we've decided like embrace it, when it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and we just, we'll just keep like pummeling the thing until it happens. <laughs> um, and yeah. Yeah, so uh, there's a couple of performative elements, right? The, the sampler that we're hitting on the table, and then there's also these joysticks, which were, um, which were created by uh, a friend of ours named Levi Lorenzo, a fantastic musician. And um, the samples, the same samples from the sampler that you heard us hitting and triggering on and off were also put into the joystick. And in the joystick, they had other parameters, slowing down, speeding up. Um, and we played with those in addition to the samples that you heard coming up just triggered on and off. And it allowed us to have sort of this other way of manipulating them in addition to not just matching them with our acoustic instruments but playing them as sort of musical ideas too. So uh, we actually loaded up the Max Patch here to show you. So uh, we have, uh, there's four buttons on top and so you have four different samples. Uh, when you go forward on the joystick, four different samples. When you go on the back, when you go back on the joystick, um, and uh, forward and back also controls volume. Uh, right and left controls sample rate. Um, and that, that right there is quite a lot to work with depending on what you put into the joystick, what samples you put in there. There's a trigger on the bottom that sends it into hyperdrive, hyperdrive and uh, uh, doubles the sample rate, so it plays it twice as fast. Um, so, found a good one. He runs to the 50, he runs to the 40. The guy is drunk, but there he goes. He wants to the 50. He runs to the 40. The guy is drunk, but there he goes. He runs to the 50, he runs to the 40. And then we can go to hyperdrive. I mean, obviously, you can imagine if you like took a bunch of like garbled granular stuff from your like euro rack and put it in there, like holy moly, you got you got a, you got a stew going. However, the really interesting thing about this is that these samples are recognizable, and anyone, any age, can understand what's happening. And that's the magic of something like this, an instrument like this. It invites audiences in and takes again the ghost out of the machine. It's a sample. We're clearly doing something by my action moving back. Is clearly causing something to happen that I'm normally used to hearing happen in a different way. So the, uh, the idea of sort of using these and showing that every time we do something, something's happening, creates, again, this musical forward motion that, that allows us to shape the piece this way. We didn't show the whole thing, but there's a very climactic moment where we both go like very forward on the joysticks and have sort of a face off, and it's the same moment that the hockey goal sound hits, and it's really, it's quite, it's quite cheesy, but it's also, it, we, we love it, we think it works, we think it's inviting, and we, um, and we also, uh, we it, it implies and builds this natural choreography into the piece. So while we're moving from instrument, while we're moving to these things and doing these actions, it's answering that question of why. I am doing this, not because it's fun to do this, but because it's actually causing an action. And all of the sort of, um, the extra musical or theatrical elements um, that are going on are things that are also mappable. So this idea of Dennis and I having this competition or this war in a way that we're facing off in a sport-like way is happening because we're actually battling over who gets to play these samples. So we're trying to build in those elements as well and make it just sort of a multi-layered performance experience. Um, so we'll move on to one last piece and we'll do it very quickly. Um, 
And if you were in our uh, um, instrumental economy class, which essentially was getting a lot out of a little drawing, the most uh, sonic possibility out of singular objects, uh, this is the opposite of that. <laughs> um, and, it, and it was a very valuable lesson uh, for me, which is uh, a piece that I wrote and spent uh, an enormous amount of time on and building this huge setup. We've played it live maybe three times because it's just an incredible amount of gear and an incredible amount of forces to kind of dial in. And it's probably where the instrumental economy idea was born out of. Just like, well, this was fun. Boy, am I glad we got a good studio recording and a good video because we just can't do this to ourselves. Um, it's just too much. Um, so there's a lot of forces involved. There's some fixed media. There's uh, a bunch of guitar pedals, one that does kind of like quick seven second uh, captures and layering and sampling, um, granular synthesis. Um, there are feedback transducers. Uh, one transducer is on a uh, thunder sheet and kind of will feed back as you sweep a microphone closer to it. Um, there's a transducer attached to a balloon that is stretched over the bell of Aaron's soprano saxophone and she has a microphone up here so she can do kind of feedback with that stuff. Um, those are being like overdriven by uh, distortion pedals that are also self-oscillating and feeding back. Um, we've blown up a bunch of transducers so the piece is also too expensive uh, to keep doing. So we'll show a little bit of the we'll setup. There's the under the hood. There's also the stage mixer there, feedback mixer, um, upside down snare drum, on blocking, thunder sheet, uh, bass drum. Oh, that I connect to. Guitar pedals, volume pedal, octave shifter, dowel rods, big tam tam. <laughs> there's a bass drum again. <laughs> Uh, and there's a little transducer mounted on the back of our, our thunder sheet. This was during the recording session. Cool. So the transducer is essentially like a, a it's a, a small speaker that needs to be kind of mounted on something to make it sound. So it's sending a great deal of, of, of vibration. Um, but if it's not mounted on a resonant object, it'll be it'll be quite soft. Um, so for example, if we took a transducer and put it on a bass drum, the sounds coming out of it would resonate in the bass drum, through the membrane of the bass drum head. Of course, also the resonant frequencies of the bass drum would also map onto those sounds. Uh, here's a little demonstration of the feedback transducer. <laughs>
So we're, we're, we're drifting into dinner. That's dangerous territory. Um, so, uh, but also we're, we're more than happy to stick around and answer questions, but I also want to give people agency to, to go eat. <laughs> um, so, yeah, feel free to do so, or uh, I don't know if we leave it to the powers that be. We can do questions live with folks here, or we can just chat. We can chat over dinner. We can chat over dinner. That sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.